Well, Brother Bobby Bridger, are you ready to do some palavering today? I, I am. <laughs> I would uh, like to, all of you girls and boys and kitties and doggies out there around the globe, um, we are, last year we were uh, streaming to over 200,000 people, and I would like to introduce Mr. Bobby Bridger, who actually is the person that instigated our cultural celebration. I don't want to take up a lot of his time, but he also is doing indigenous audio books. He's an author, he's a balladeer, he's a... He's a writer, he's a historian, and I like to call him Bubba. <laughs> Mr. Bobby Bridger, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, sissy. <laughs> well, this conference has uh, certainly grown, and I kind of, uh, the, the phase that we're in right now, coming out of COVID and uh, uh, having to pull everything down to its essence, has, I think it's been a good period, and Charlotte and the staff have done really a fantastic job. Uh, we don't have the big crowds that we have when the COVID thing didn't hit us, but it's now sh down to this wonderful, intense thing that's happening here as we do the conference during the week instead of on a weekend even to get past this period in our country's uh, progression. Anyway, the reason I'm here, I'm often uh, called to sing songs as I've made my life uh, journey around the guitar and writing songs and have had a reasonable, reasonable amount of success doing that. But the thing that has always uh, motivated me was being an activist for Indian concerns and that's how I got involved with this great museum was suggesting a conference like this to Charlotte and she acted on it and made it happen as only someone like Charlotte could do. So anyway, I'm going to start out with a song and then explain why I'm here really. Is there one moment we are born for? One perfect moment in our lifetime. Or is our lifetime? One perfect moment Gone in the blinking of an eye Do we come here with unique purpose? Directed by forces unspoken or seen Or could we be randomness or searching For what our randomness if there is reason in the world, we'll never know. Till we depart The questions of lifetime Are of moments Our answers listening i 
As the North Star shines in the heaven Celestial compass, it's forever true Intuitions are only clues. Is there one moment we are born? Thank you. Uh, I've often wondered that if uh, that the questions in that song, if if we're not born for one perfect moment, kind of like all critters and creatures, you know, that we're here for that special thing that we're here to do. And I believe that's true. That we are all have a special thing that we can do and contribute to. Matakwiasi, as we say, and also that I believe that it's, it comes when you listen to your heart, and I've always done that as an artist, and that's how I ended up here at this museum, was following my heart because I had it in mind to uh, devote my entire career to performing primarily uh, for people who didn't normally get a lot of entertainment. Uh, I grew up in a tiny, tiny little town in Louisiana, under under a thousand people living in that town. And I learned that when you come from a little small town, you're always somebody. That uh, uh, there's always somebody in that town that remembers you when you were that big or that big or that big or whatever, and can tell stories about you and so forth. It's kind of like being in a tribal community. You know what I mean? That uh, So I felt like I kind of grew up in a small little tribe anyway. But I was always impressed when the magician came to school because it was the only time we got any real entertainment other than what we provided for ourselves. And so when I uh, found success in the music business, I decided that I was going to go to places that didn't normally get entertainment to do my entertainment. And that's what I've done. And in 1972, uh, when this book that I'm working on, an audio book of now, God is Red, was published in 1973. And I'm going to talk about audio books now. I was uh, under contract to RCA Records the largest record label in the world. I had risen to that point in five years from my first recording session. I was signed uh, to the label for uh, five years to 10 album contract, which was kind of unheard of at the time. And I was signed to the largest music publisher in the world, E.H. Morris. The old Johnny Mercer, everybody's heard of Johnny Mercer. Well, this was his catalog, and I was signed to his writing company to write songs for them. And I had a big-time manager in Hollywood, and Nashville was, I'd already done well in Nashville. So everything was going well for me. And in 73, right after the book came out, I read God is Red by Vine Deloria, Jr., and I still have that book, and it's amazing it's held on because of the notes I scribbled in the book and how many times I wrote in the border, I have to meet this man in the book, Vine Deloria Jr. I just never dreamed I would ever have that opportunity. And then in 1975, 
I was, uh, I had, was preparing to record an epic ballad that I wrote about the mountain men. Uh, and I was invited to perform that ballad for the Colorado Bicentennial Centennial Commission. This was right before America's Bicentennial. And they were, uh, a, they were a group of businessmen and bankers and lawyers and all sorts of uh, people from the Colorado, state of Colorado who had been gathered together to decide how Colorado was going to celebrate its 100-year anniversary and the nation's bicentennial. And so it was a big deal. And some of the men at this meeting were there who could contribute to an album I was recording with the Los Gonzo Band and, Jer and Ramblin' Jack Elliott and a few other people in Denver. And so one of the board members, uh, commission members, uh, got me an, uh, an audition for these guys to see if they might give me some money to, for, to, for my recording project and get an endorsement and it would go out as part of Colorado's centennial celebration. And so we met in this fancy, fancy uh, home, big palatial mansion in Denver. And I walked in and the first person I noticed was a guy sitting over on a windowsill, windowsill with a white dress shirt on with the sleeves rolled up past the elbows and blue jeans with the knees kind of worn out on them. And the first thing I noticed after I noticed him was that he was smoking a cigarette and the guy that owned the house had made me put my cigarette out before I came in. In those days, I smoked cigarettes, pell-mell cigarettes, without a filter. And so I was taken with this man because I recognized him as an Indian right off the bat. And then when they went around and introduced everybody, they said, this is Vine Deloria, who's a commission member. And I was just flabbergasted. And I was supposed to play a, this epic ballad about mountain men. But I had another epic ballad that I had written about the Lakota Indians. And so I made a decision because the only other Indian I had played that ballad for was Russell Means. And he threatened to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, I'm going to play this for Vine Deloria. Uh, and I told the audience there, I know I'm supposed to play this Mountain Man show, but I've been wanting to meet this man. And I have the opportunity, so I'm going to play my Lakota ballad. And I made up my mind that if he threatened to kill me, I would never do it again. And so I finished, I finished performing it, and he walked over to me and he said, I had a blonde hair down on my shoulders and a beard and everything. He said, you look so much like George Armstrong Custer, you've set my scalping knight a knife a twitching. <laughs> and so, I thought, well, that was it for this long thing I worked all those years on. <laughs> I'll never do it again. He said, do you like buffalo? And I said, I, I still ate meat in those days. And I said, yeah. He said, let's go up to Bent's Fort and eat some buffalo. And so we went out and got in the car. And as soon as I shut the door to the car, he said, I'll bet you when you record that piece, you're planning on giving all of that to the Indian, the proceeds seeds from that to the Indians, aren't you? And I said, thought to myself, boy, is that a trick question? How do you answer that question? How am I going to answer that question? And so I said, yes. He said, that would be one of the biggest mistakes you ever made. I said, boy, then I didn't, I truly didn't know what to say. He said, I created an institute after I published Custer Died for Your Sins called the Native American Legal Institute. He said, after three years, I go in there and they don't know who I am. <laughs> he said, so you, he said, you make all the money you, you can make off of this and then you'll know who to share it with. And let's go eat some buffalo. <laughs> and from that point forward, we were best friends. And... Uh, I never had a better friend in the world. Now I need to tell you how this happened also. 
two days before I met him, I was driving up for this great concert. And I told my wife at the time, we were playing that game, if you could meet anybody you wanted to meet, who would it be? And I said, Vine Deloria Jr., of course. Uh, normally in the old days, I would have said Groucho Marx, you know. But, uh, and then two days later, I met him. I met Vine Deloria Jr. <laughs> so I think I literally wished to meet him. And so that brings me to why I'm here talking about audiobooks. Ooh, uh, this was about seven or eight years ago. I was getting ready to do, perform a gig. I traveled around the world performing music. And uh, my son and my side man were listening to audiobooks. And I said, what are you guys doing while I'm tuning up over here and everything? Said, well, we're heavy into this audiobook. I'm into another one over here. So I asked my publisher at the time, who's also Dan's publisher, I said, why haven't you guys put any audiobooks out? And, and Sam, who's also a co-founder of the conference here, said, uh, we haven't been able to get any traction. They're very expensive to do, and we haven't been able to get anybody to, that can turn out a, a seller that can make its money back. And so he said, uh, I said, well, that's just a big mystery. And so I went home that night all puzzled about why there were no audiobooks coming from Fulcrum. And I woke up at about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I knew how to solve that problem for Fulcrum. So I called Sam at about 7 o'clock in the morning, and I said, you're not getting any traction for your books because you haven't put Babe Ruth in the game. And they, they had all of Vine Deloria's books. And so I said to Sam, why haven't you put an audio book of Vine's books out? And he said, that would be you. And I said, what? He said, you're the only person that any of us know who has any experience in the recording business. You were his dear friend for 30 years. You know books. You write books. You're the guy to do it. And I thought, after a while, I thought, I don't know anything about audio books. But yeah, I'll do it. And so we jumped in full steam because, and I knew I could do it because I was good friends with Wes Studi, the famous Indian actor. And I knew Wes would want to do this. And so w Sam said, which book do you want to do? I said, let's do the last one, the one that, that, he, that he, he delivered the world we used to live in, remembering the powers of the medicine men to Fulcrum, his publisher, and died two weeks after he delivered that book. And so that to me was, uh, that was a signal that something was special about that book. And so of all the other big famous books of his, that was the one I decided to do the first one with. And I also knew that Wes Studi is gifted he can do multiple voices, and he can speak in, in different Indian languages with authenticity and with drama. And so I knew that that would work for this book. And so we started, and we did this audio book that came out in 2019. And I was told at the time that the, if, if, I, if I was going to expect a good, a good selling book in the Indian uh, genre that expect to sell about 800 copies. We are now approaching 30, uh, 2,700 copies of sold on Audible and at indigenous audiobooks together of the world we used to live in. And what I'm doing now, what I'm trying to do with some people that I know, I'm trying to link up a lot of different people who have similar interests. Uh, J.R. Matthews has been here uh, around our uh, conference already. He's been a part of the conference since the start. He was one of the first people I thought to invite to be a part of it. Because when I was doing shows in Indian country over in Oklahoma, I would go see J.R. and his mother, Flossie. Who, Flossie was an elder in the Quapaw tribe. 
And if I did a show at the Coleman Theater there, uh, which I did at one point, which J.R. is the feature of this story, and his mother, dear Flossie, late Flossie, we miss her dearly. Uh, I said, I want to give some tickets away to all the tribes to come to see the show. Remember, I said, I go where places where people don't normally get a lot of entertainment. That was where I developed my one-man shows, was there on Indian reservations, performing for them. And so Flossie and J.R. arranged meetings for me with all the headmen over in that area, the Shawnee, the Choctaw, the Miami, the, uh, the Cherokee, all of them. And I went and sat with the headmen, gave them free passes to the show that they could distribute to whoever they wanted, and they came to the show. And I decided that if we could get that same kind of thing going, that we could attract young Indian kids over here to uh, Bentonville, to the conference. And that's when I called Sam Senta and said, hey, look, we can do this conference. If we can get some Indian kids, maybe we can discover some new writers which is what I was look, wanting to find and what Sam was looking for. And so we went, I went over and met with all the headmen over there and invited them to send people over to get buses and send kids over. Nothing happened. And I thought, oh, this is the old white man coming to see the Indian. And they go, oh, we've seen this guy before. We, all, we know what he's, you know. And so I understood why no one came because uh, Indian people have, they've had it up to here with white people coming and saying, oh, I want to learn all about the res and whatever, and then going back and writing a book about it and so forth, you know. So uh, the, the, the thing was patience to, and go back again and ask again, hey, we're doing this concert thing over here. We're doing this conference. We want you to come. And if there are any kids that are interested in writing, this is what the, they should come for. And again, they didn't come. That's when I said, call Dan Wildcat. <laughs> get in touch with Dan Wildcat at Haskell. We got to get some kids down here because I knew Dan could get kids involved with this. And that's what I'm all about right now. We had success with that people told me you couldn't, you couldn't, even the publisher said, we don't get any traction, we couldn't get any traction. We went and made traction happen. We, and we did it just by grunting work, you know, just getting out there and making it happen. Now what I'm trying to do, J.R. Matthews has a scholarship program at Oklahoma State. They, he lost his middle, our youngest son to a terrible accident. And he and his wife immediately went to work and created a scholarship. They've got 10 students at Oklahoma State on a full scholarship. Now they have them. I also know an audio engineer in Austin, Texas, whose father was literally the voice of broadcasting in America during the 40s and 50s, Martin Block was uh, the biggest disc jockey in America. His son, Joel Block, is a 30, 40 year friend of mine. He's a graduate of Oklahoma State University. <laughs> and so I'm now in process of trying to put a thing together there to get scholarships. I, what we need and what audiobooks need and what I hope evolves into Indian audiobooks, indigenous audiobooks, is Indian storytellers coming forth and telling their own stories in this format because it is the modern version of oral history. That's exactly what it is. And as I've traveled up, when I went up to the Northwest Indian College in uh, Bellingham, I talked up there, spoke about it, and brought this subject up, and most of those people present said, we're already recording our family history. They're already doing it, you see. So that's just another step now to get to this commercial format with it. And so I created a, a, a website called Indigenous Audiobooks. 
And the purpose for that is that by the time we have created this, this entity that is doing, we're, we're working on the big one now is God is Red. And then after that, we'll probably do either uh, the Jung book or the Metaphysics of Modern Existence uh, as an audio book. And what, I have two minutes? Whoa, whoa, I, I was just getting started. <laughs> uh, after, uh, what I'm intent on doing, to summarize, is to give a fully functional working business audio book company to indigenous leadership, indigenous administration, and indigenous artists who are doing the books. And if I can, if I can live long enough to complete this first step, we will have students from Oklahoma State, students from Haskell coming to Austin, Texas with me working in the studio with Wes and with my audio engineers, learning the craft, learning how to do this, learning how to act the voices, because you can't just sit down and read an audio book. You have to act an audio book or it will not, it's not gonna go anywhere. It'll just be somebody sounding like they're reading in the third grade. And that it has to be a dramatic reading. To do that, you have to train to do it. And so, what I'm I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna I've got I'm a young man still. I'm 78, but what the heck? <laughs> I'm gonna have that happen before I go see the great maker, uh, the creator. Uh, I'm gonna get that in motion. If we get two students, if we get two students come, to come down and study with us and go back and tell people what they're learning, what they're doing, then we will have a group of people that can soon take, and also we're gonna work with administrative and business schools so that you learn how to keep this thing going because it's not an easy task to keep an audio book company out. You have to promote it constantly. It's a constant thing. And, it was press releases and media and all this kind of stuff. So I know how to do that. And that's what I know how to teach people how to do. That's what I'm all about. That's the, where my career is going. This is getting ready to go to my son. I'm getting ready to f devote my full attention to this. And that's what Indian indigenous audiobooks is all about. It came from that meeting. When my boy came in there, he was 14. And Dan was talking about indigenuity, and he was playing on a Game Boy. And when we when we left, because he was used to, when I was talking with a, adults, he had learned a long time ago to get in the corner and play with his. But he was listening. And when we got in the car, he said to me, because I had been playing in a casino, and they wouldn't even let him come in. And when he went in, he said. He was 14, he said, this is the biggest Game Boy I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> and I thought, it is. It's a big toy that these people are playing with. And so he gets in the car and he says, you know, Dad, what, what Dr. Wildcat was saying, he said it made me think that all of us now live in a lot of time in cyberspace. And we're all indigenous there. The, the Indians are indigenous there and the whites are indigenous there. So that's where we could get all this trouble worked out. And I went, wow, indigenous audiobooks. And that's where this whole thing really got, got started was out of that kid's mouth. And he'll be here tomorrow. He won the essay contest last year. So he's here to announce this year's winner. And he'll be here to do that. I'm not even going to get to see him because <laughs> I've got to go back and work on God is Red. <laughs> anyway, I meant to talk a lot more about this, but uh, I guess I spoke what was in my heart today, so I guess that's what's important. So uh, I hope if you're interested, you will check out, uh, you can go on Audible and you can get the world we used to live in, remembering the powers of the medicine men. And when you do that, remember that 
when I get to see Vine in the spirit world on the great adventure, I'm sure he's going to dress me down severely because he hated technology. <laughs> and and the, to do his books as audio books required a lot of uh, contemplation before I went forward with it, I have to say that. But now that we're doing it, I know his widow loves it, and I know his son loves it, and so it's full steam ahead. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to me talk like this for a few minutes, and I appreciate you coming to the conference and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. <laughs>